Hello, everyone. We've got with us today Philippe Cousteau, the grandson of the legendary Jacques Cousteau. He's the founder of uh, Earth Echo International. You do not want to miss this episode, so stay with us. Welcome to Your Mark on the World, bringing you another changemaker with champion of social good, Devin D. Thorpe. Philippe, welcome to the show. It's an honor to have you. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much. All right. We appreciate you coming up for air for just long enough to do this. <laughs> it's, uh, it's my pleasure. Man. Thanks. Uh, you have, in many ways, carried on the legacy of your grandfather in the work that you do. Uh, tell us a little bit about your connection to your grandfather. Well, my grandfather had a, a tremendously important role in my life. Um, you know, he, in fact, this year is the 75th anniversary of his invention of the aqualong, uh, of diving, essentially. And um, that work was, of course, something that uh, he dedicated his entire life to, not only the invention of scuba diving, but then what that led him into and making all the films and documentaries and exploring uh, the, the oceans for so many decades. Uh, and growing up with that legacy, I was very influenced by him. Um, we didn't see each other very, very often, a few times a year, but when we did, they were very special uh, moments. And, um, and I attribute a lot of my perspective and a lot of the, the, the passion that I have for the work that I do to the time that I did spend with him. As you, you grew up, though, you would have known your grandfather in the same way that the rest of us knew him, at least th those of us of a certain age. Uh, you know, you would have seen him on television. You would have, how did it feel to watch him and his work from a distance at intervals and then to experience that firsthand? You know, it, it was, uh, it was always weird because you see this person and you talk to people and you see it on television and people are, you know, revered him uh, wherever he went. Still to this day, uh, I think it happened twice on my flight home from uh, Fiji yesterday where we were filming for one of the shows that I host. Uh, security personnel and one check-in agent, maybe three times on the three or four legs that it took to get home, uh, were like, Cousteau, oh, I loved his show, I loved him, I loved your work, you know, I've been following what you've been doing, blah, blah, blah. So still he has this, you know, this, uh, this many people have reverence for him. Uh, so seeing that, seeing him in that role, was always a little strange for me because I also saw him in a role where we went to get ice cream when we visited him in Paris. And when we'd, uh, uh, you know, he loved model trains and going to the toy store and, and we'd buy model trains together uh, with me and, and going home and putting them together and, and things that were much more personal and intimate um, was an interesting juxtaposition with this global icon who was speaking at the United Nations and in Congress and all these different uh, places and venues all over the world. So I, I got to see both sides of him, and, and he was warm and fun and, uh, and a terrific guy. Can you imagine that you would have founded Earth Echo International if Jacques Cousteau were not your grandfather? I don't, I certainly, I, I, I don't know, of course, but I don't think that, that, that I would have had the same perspective, uh, the same impetus to start the organization because it was very much influenced by him. Um, even though we founded it years after he passed away, uh, he was someone who believed very much in the power of young people, particularly towards the end of his life, in being the change agents that we need to invest in if we're going to broaden the constituency of people that care about clean air and clean water and, and are motivated by those issues in, in terms of how they behave and, and, uh, and how they lead their lives. He recognized that uh, it's not a small group of people that will, um, that will really drive change. This has to be a global shift in how we, we approach our planet and ourselves and our health and our security and our economy and all of those things that are connected with the environment. Um, and so he was really a movement builder. He was really a storyteller, if any, if, more than anything else, and a problem solver. And for him, the problem that he saw was a world that was rapidly uh, diminishing the, the very resources that we all need to sustain and thrive. Um, and, uh, and his specific focus on young people was really what drove us uh, to found Earth Echo with that, with that focus. Tell us about what Earth Echo is and about the programs and the reach and the activities. 
Well, Earth Echo International is a nonprofit. We've been around for about 15 years now. One of the leading youth environmental education groups in the country. And we're all about empowering young people with new tools and knowledge uh, to help them solve problems. We believe young people, you know, are not just the, the, the hands and feet of the environmental movement, but can be very much the hearts and minds that uh, if we give them opportunity, uh, that they really can change the world and that they have a tremendous impact on the world around them. Uh, I think one of the challenges and one of the reasons actually that we're still fighting many of the same battles is that the environmental movement at large has done a very poor job of investing in young people. Um, you know, largely uh, the, the NGOs out there uh, focus on legislative fixes or short-term environmental fixes, uh, protecting land or whatever it may be. Um, instead of growing the constituency, growing a community of people that actually really care about this. We saw in the last election, um, you know, climate change wasn't even a, a, a topic that came up in any of the debates. And unfortunately, uh, today in this country, people have uh, been willing to allow themselves politically to be poisoned uh, when it comes to science and the truth about what's happening. Um, you know, environmental issues have become political issues. Uh, and, a, and, a, and a, a wedge issue that, um, uh, that I think is largely because we haven't grown the audience of people that really care about these issues and recognize that, you know, we can argue about foreign policy, we can argue about economic policy, but when it comes right down to it, uh, clean air and clean water are non-negotiable. And it's a tragedy that that, that has become an issue that, that divides people, whereas it should be an issue that unites people. And that is a relatively recent occurrence um, I always like to remind people, I did a TED Talk earlier this year, that um, you know, Richard Nixon passed the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Uh, he founded the EPA. Um, and, and yet, just in the last few decades, there have been certain politicians that have decided that they can divide people with the environment. And this lie that is propagated that investing in sustainability and conservation is somehow kills jobs and hurts the economy, which is complete nonsense. Um, has, has caught on. And so I think that, uh, you know, part of that is, is because we have not invested in youth as a movement and we have not uh, uh, grown the constituency, as I said, of people that really care about these issues. How have you been able to grow, let's start with revenue, because all enterprises, even nonprofit re enterprises, require revenue. Where does the revenue come from and how have you grown that over the years? Well, we have... Uh, uh, you know, we're supported by individuals, by foundations, and by corporate partnerships. The corporate partnerships actually are very interesting and very important for us. Um, and that has been a source of growth because a lot of the work that we do uh, is really focused on science and STEM. And we've been doing this for a very long time before it became trendy because what we recognize is that if we want to get in front of young people, uh, particularly in the classroom, which is where young people spend most of their time, what better way to study biology, and chemistry, and engineering than nature, because that's where it all comes from and it all comes together. And so for, last, you know, for the last several years, we have really been focusing on, on how we uh, deal with and talk about important environmental issues in the context of the classroom and in the context of helping teachers do their jobs and teach these concepts, uh, basic STEM concepts, science, technology, engineering, and math, to young people. It just so happens that in the last few years, this has become a very hot topic as we recognize and many corporations recognize that we're not churning out the, the youth that we need with the skills that we need related to STEM uh, to fill the jobs that we have uh, in an increasingly technological society. And so um, we've been doing a lot of the same work for a long time and a lot of corporations are starting to recognize, wow, that you have effects, you have impact, um, and, uh, and we wanna get on board with the work that you're doing uh, in particular, the last few years, we launched a STEM career program as well, uh, which gets young people excited about careers in STEM and so that they can see a light at the end of the tunnel because unfortunately, a lot of the STEM subjects, kids just don't think they're relevant and don't see, oh, what am I gonna do with this when I grow up? Why, why should I care about studying math or science or any of these things? And so what we're really doing is helping them see uh, that light at the end of the tunnel with their careers and that they're very exciting and engaging and that they need to stick to it in the classroom. Um, and a lot of corporations are very interested in that because it really helps them deal with a, a, a very serious problem that they're facing today. And tell us a little bit about the operation of the organization. You've got, I think, half a dozen full-time employees. Uh, tell us about how you do so much with so little. 
Well, you know, we, we, we like to work smarter, not harder. And um, so we're really all about uh, having a core group of people that are stewarding um, and parenting these programs. And then, you know, half a dozen full time, but we will have lots of different people that we can go to in our, in our uh, um, you know, list of uh, a Rolodex, so to speak, of, of partners that um, really help us maximize our impact. And so, for example, on the, the STEM Explore program, uh, which is all about the STEM careers, we partner with a lot of different groups. Uh, most recently, we're partnering with Step Up, which focuses on bringing STEM careers into uh, uh, inner cities with a particular focus on girls. And so we don't like to reinvent the wheel. There's far too much of that already in the environmental movement, in most movements, actually. Um, and so we're really big believers in, in partnerships and working with groups that can help maximize our impact. We work with school districts across the country, uh, thousands of teachers. Um, we have our Youth Leadership Council, which is uh, about 15 incredible youth leaders between the ages of 16 and 22 from around the country and around the world that also work with us on our programs to help their professional development. So, um, you know, we have six core people by extension. We're, you know, well over a dozen. You uh, are, are doing, uh, you know, some amazing work. You have a unique perspective. Uh, what are the most important things that individuals can do to protect the environment, especially the oceans, from the effects of climate change? Well, you know, the, the, the real issues that we're facing, and they're in the headlines all the time, particularly one that's been captivating people is plastics in the ocean that has been very uh, worrisome. It is very worrisome. Um, it's, uh, it's just a, a symptom of a, of a broader problem where we have a disconnect between our um, social and economic system and political system and the realities of our environment uh, and the needs that it has to maintain the very systems we rely on. And that really stems from a challenge of, um, of a rapidly growing population. You know, my, my, uh, when my grandfather was born in 1910, think about this, there were 1.6 billion people on this planet. Now, 2,000 years ago, uh, during the Roman Empire, there were around two to 300 million people. So when you start to plot that and you look at that gradual increase up until the beginning of the 20th century, now we're at seven and a half billion and it's skyrocketed. Um, so we're packing more and more people into the same space that, uh, that we expect to get the same benefit from. And um, already all of our fisheries uh, are fished at maximum capacity or overfished. Um, you know, we, we are, regardless of what some people want to admit or, or accept, we're dealing with a rapidly warming climate, um, which has a, a series of, of, uh, of very real consequences for us as a species. Um, we're already seeing conflicts, and this is where... Uh, I think that um, uh, people aren't recognizing the, the, the truth. I'll give you one real quick example um, of how, how environmental degradation uh, has a huge impact on all of us economically from a security perspective and, and from a, a, a health perspective. And you're, people aren't connecting the dots. So in, we've all heard of the piracy crisis in the Gulf of Aden and Southern Red Sea. This is an issue that's been going on for well over a decade. And in fact, the genesis of that issue is that in, um, God, in the early 1990s, with the, the Somali state was uh, in deep trouble, which it still is, um, fishermen were unable to uh, police their own fisheries off land, off offshore, their fisheries that had supported them for millennia. And Russia, the EU, China, and other countries were coming in and, and illegally fishing off those waters. And so what these fishermen did um, is they armed themselves. And they began to, to fight off these illegal fishing boats. And they, they hijacked a few of them um, in protest and were given money to return those boats. The light bulb went off. And that then evolved into the piracy crisis that we have now, which costs uh, somewhere between 60 and $80 billion a year uh, in direct costs to maintain military and other uh, uh, forces out in the, the Red Sea. Um, there's more than 25% of, of the world's uh, goods pass through the Suez Canal. Uh, that is uh, having to be policed as well and being impacted, the economies in those regions. The money from that tourism, uh, terrorism, excuse me, uh, from the, the, the piracy is supporting groups like Al-Shabaab, uh, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb. And so there's a direct conduit to terrorism that is, as we've all seen, continues to affect us every day here in the United States, half a world away. 
Um, and so for a few million dollars of fisheries conservation, we could have avoided hundreds of billions of dollars of costs, direct costs to the global economy, likely a lot more to that in indirect costs, tens of thousands of people dying, and funding going to terrorism, which has all sorts of other consequences, as we know, terrible consequences. So I think that, that uh, you know, the challenge for us is, is how we start to connect the dots and do a better job of recognizing that all of these issues affect us, whether or not we care about a polar bear or we care about a coral reef. Um, and that's the way that I believe we're, we're going to have people recognize that these issues affect them, is when we connect the dots for them and we help them understand that when we talk about the environment, we're talking about our security, our economy, and the health of your family. Those are entry points that matter to people. Um, I think we need to do less talking about polar bears and more talking about children's health and security um, uh, and how the healthy environment or lack thereof is affecting those things. That's a great observation and a powerful one. I appreciate you sharing that. Philippe, you've had an extraordinary career yourself. And of course, you were schooled by uh, your grandfather, your father, who were, uh, uh, you know, tremendously successful in their own right. What's the most important lesson you've learned over your career? I think the most important lesson that I've learned is that tenacity is a virtue. Um, you know, setting out to start a nonprofit and do the work that we've done uh, is not easy. Uh, and that, that everything we, we've been faced with, we've stuck to our guns and we've worked hard, long, hard days, hard nights, um, and, uh, and, and built something that matters. I think, uh, uh, you know, I've also realized over the years that, uh, you know, purpose is, is so important. And I think we've lost a lot of that sense of, of the importance of having purpose in our lives, in our society, in the rat race of, of the pursuit of the almighty dollar. Um, and, uh, and, you know, my grandfather was a, was a, was a big believer in tenacity, um, and a big believer in problem solving problems. When he, 75 years ago, when he first, uh, in January, 75 years ago, when he first set foot in the Marne River outside of Paris with the, the, the prototype of the Aqualung, which became the scuba uh, system, um, it was years of tinkering. And the reason that he did that is because he wanted to, he was an avid free diver. Um, he was in the Navy at the time, and he was frustrated he couldn't spend more time underwater. Uh, simple as that. And um, um, he tinkered for years with an engineer and they designed something that revolutionized and changed the world. He was a, uh, you know, my grandfather was born on a kitchen table in a small little town in saint andre de Cubsac in Bordeaux in France. And so, um, uh, you know, that, that sense of tenacity and purpose, uh, I think is, is, is the most important lessons to, to never let go of those uh, in, in your life. Now, you come, uh from this family with this tremendous legacy of uh, working in, in the seas and the, the environmental awareness and all of that, but uh, you could have done anything. Uh, you know, you could be a lawyer, <laughs> you know, you could be a plumber. Uh, why did you choose to follow in your father's and grandfather's footsteps the way you have? You know, a big part of what drives Earth Echo is a focus on getting young people engaged with their hands, getting them outdoors, getting them to have experiences. And that stems from an experience that I had, which is what inspired me to do the work that I do. Uh, I was 16 and um, I was uh, on a trip. I was asked to, to join a, an incredible pioneering oceanographer, Dr. Eugenie Clark. Um, on a trip to Papua New Guinea to conduct research with her for two weeks in an area called Milne Bay in the southeastern corner of the, of the, uh, of the nation. And um, I was there for two weeks and we were conducting science all day and every day. And, and this was an incredible opportunity because, you know, I never actually got a chance to join my grandfather on expedition. Um, he was quite a bit old, older than, than his heyday when I was uh, young. He wasn't really going on an expedition. He was more of an elder statesman at that point. So I never, I, I never really got to go into expeditions and, and out into the field with him or, or the crew. Um, so when I was invited at 16, my mom said, absolutely go. And I went uh, with Jeannie, spent two weeks there. And then on my own, I went up to the highlands of New Guinea, um, uh, 16. And we were diving in very like 
nasty kind of very nutrient rich water. It wasn't dirty, just had lots of nutrients. It was very warm. I got a really bad ear infection. I didn't have antibiotics, which I now always carry with me. I'm a big believer in not over prescribing antibiotics and I never really use, usually don't have to take them, but I always have a little Z-Pack with me now when I travel internationally because I did not at the time. And the ear, my ear started, was infected at all swollen and it was terrible. And we went to a clinic in Alatau in this little town and one of the nuns looked at my ear and she said, you have to fly to Port Morphy immediately because this could get into your brain and it's all bad. So I, there were all these crazy experiences at 16. I, I almost died. I'm diving for two weeks. I'm doing all these incredible adventures. I recovered in Port Morrisby for a couple of days. I went up to the highlands, saw these tribes that had, had very little exposure to human beings uh, from the West. Um, and uh, many, for many of them, it was the first white person they'd ever seen and, and had that whole crazy, amazing experience and then came back down to Port Morrisby and uh, left the hotel when I was told not to because 16 year olds don't always make great decisions and was chased by, um, by a gang through the streets until I literally ran into some policemen that scared them off and I ran back to the hotel and they were like, you're really lucky. Because uh, uh, Port Morrison was very, very dangerous at the time. And so I had all these crazy conflicting experiences and, and um, that's really what said to me, uh, I don't want to do anything else. I can't imagine um, anything would be more exciting and amazing than being able to travel. Um, I came home, I did lots of different lectures to first my school and then different events and, and conferences about my experience when we still had slides, uh, give slideshows. And, and the idea that I could have these adventures and these experiences like my father and like my grandfather and then share them with the world, that, that was the key that, that, uh, that I didn't just keep them to myself, um, was so exciting and uh, really launched me into the career that, that I had pursued. Philippe, what's your superpower? Uh, I like to think that I am um, I know what I don't know. I think that's very important. Uh, we always say that, that know what you don't know. Um, we don't have all the answers and that um, you know really be willing to work and surround yourself by smart people who do have the answers and listen to them. Um, but uh, uh, you know hubris is a, is a terrible thing. And I think too many of our leaders suffer from that uh, affliction. Um, and uh, uh, it's very important, I believe, to, to work um, with other people who help enhance you and, and you can enhance them. Um, and, uh, and be willing to say, I have no idea, but never give up in, in terms of trying to find the, the answer, um, no matter how or who it takes to help you to, uh, to do that. Well, fantastic. Well, Philippe, we're so grateful that you would take the time to be with us. I know we've gone over a little bit, uh, and so I, I'm sure you've got to be on to the next thing. But before you go, if you would, just take a moment and tell people how they can learn more about Earth Echo, Echo International and how they can connect with you personally. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, they can uh, follow Earth Echo at earthecho.org, and uh, all of our, our social media is at Earth Echo. And then um, we always have information about the different things that I'm up to at my website, philippecousteau.com, and then also my Instagram and, and those kinds of uh, social media handles are all at P. Cousteau. Um, we're very active on uh, Instagram more than uh, probably other platforms, but um, lots of good information all those places. Fantastic. Well, Philippe, again, thank you so much for your time, and we wish you every success in your continuing efforts to save the world's environment. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. All righty. Let's do some good. Thank you for listening. This podcast was recorded via Google Hangouts on Air and is available at youtube.com forward slash Devonthorpe. Subscribe to this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes by searching for Your Mark on the World. Every weekday, Devon hosts a CEO, celebrity, entrepreneur or other changemaker here on the Your Mark on the World show to inspire and prepare you to make your mark. Devin is a champion of social good, writing about, advocating for, and advising people who are doing good. He is a Forbes contributor who is a recognized thought leader in social entrepreneurship, impact investing, and crowdfunding. To book Devin as a speaker, visit devinthorpe.com. Learn more about Devin's work at yourmarkontheworld.com.